Hello friends, welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Dr. Jayadeep Sharangi, Faculty Department of English, Jogesh Chandra Choudhury College, University of Calcutta, Kolkata. Friends, we are into module 14. Module 14 is on the Canterbury Tales, the exemplary and the most important work by Geoffrey Chaucer. This module is prepared by Dr. Mohua Bhomik, who teaches English at Derozio College, Kolkata. Friends, in this particular module, we are going to learn the text called Canterbury Tales. In our previous module, we have learned about the contribution of Geoffrey Chaucer and his three important literary careers. That means three phases of his literary career, French period, British period and the Italian period. Now, in this particular module, we have a specific text, the text which is possibly by far the best text in the Middle English period and possibly from the pain of Geoffrey Chaucer, Canterbury Tales. Friends, we start with the pilgrims. Pilgrims just on the screen, see pilgrims going for a visit to the tomb of Thomas, a Becket at Canterbury, meet at the Tabard Inn in Southwark, telling tales from diverse literary and folk sources. Friends, the social background is paramount in the text. It is the age of black death, peasants revolt, the statute of laborers, corruption rampant in the church services, oblique comment on the troublesome issues of Chaucer's contemporary times. As we all know, literature is committed to social courses. Chaucer is a committed artist. It is interesting that in Canterbury Tales, only a few characters like the knight, person, the plowman are delineated by Chaucer as ideal figures without any tinge of irony. The knight is the representative of the highest forms of chivalry, while the poor person is a Christian in the truest sense of the term. Again, the plowman is not only a good-hearted man, but also enormously hard-working. Considering the contemporary social background, these characters are too good to believe, particularly keeping in mind that it was the age of black death, peasants revolt and the statute of laborers. Moreover, corruption was rampant in the church. In this kind of situation, chivalry was a first and all kinds of privileges were being enjoyed by a chosen minority, while the common masses were immense and had to face misery. Plight, economic deprivation and diseases. Considering these social and economical issues, Chaucer's portrayal of the knight, the person and the plowman as almost ideal figures might suggest that these are nostalgic portraits through which Chaucer might comment obliquely on the troublesome issues of his contemporary times without being overtly critical about all those. Friends, now up the screen you have General Prologue, probably written during the late 1380s. It introduces the characters, sets the scene, explains the entire scheme of the tales. The General Prologue was probably written during the late 1380s, not only introduces the characters but also set the scene. This is the point the spoken short plain 
that each u to shorty with our in the which shall tell tell to Canterbury word I mean it so and homeward he sell tell and where to of adventures that William and Buffalo line number 790 to 795. The initial plan was to make each pilgrim narrate two tales during the journey to Canterbury and another two tales while coming back. However, the plan could not be fully executed because it was too ambitious a project. The general prologue introduces 26 pilgrims, the five guildsmen being considered a group. Apart from them, the second nun, the nun's priest, the host and Chaucer himself also joined the pilgrimage. There is reference to another character who is the con canon's yeoman. He is not described in the general prologue, but he joins the pilgrims near Canterbury. Later, Chaucer changes the plan and restricts the telling of tales to one per pilgrim. At the time of beginning of person's tale, and host declares, how lucketh us no tales no than one none which clarifies the point that Chaucer now changes his initial plan and restrict, restricts each pilgrim to one tale only. However, he himself narrates two tales because his first tale, the tale of Sir Tapos, was left incomplete because of the interruption made by the host. The general prologue serves as an introduction to the entire text, describing most of the pilgrims, but not all of them. It is followed by groups of tales, though the groups are not directly linked with each other. Many of the tales have individual prologues, where the tailor performs to introduce his story. Sometimes such a prologue also contains comments on earlier stories. Towards the beginning of this general prologue, Chaucer explains his intention to describe his fellow pilgrims in three categories. To tell you all the condi conditicum, that is line number 38 to 41, just audio for your reading on the screen. So Chaucer plans to describe them as which they are in, that is that kind of people they are, of what degree that is which social rank the pilgrims belong to and in what array. That is their appearance. However, this categorization is not followed in this order. In fact, the items which should come together are often found separated. For instance, the order followed in the description of the square seems to be odd and highlights this point as referred to above. The square is described as a lover and curtly here. He was 20 years old. So the square is described as a lover with curly hair. He was 20 years old, having strongly built body, having fought with the hope of winning his beloved's favor. His fashionable taste as far as dressing is concerned has the ability to do everything suitable for a young man in love is humble and sits opposite to his father at table. This random selection of different traits of characters and the casualness associated with their delineation make the character portrayals realistic. This lack of order or the casualness associated with the order lends an air of spontaneity, innocence and naturalness to the style of writing. It enhances the ironic effect on the whole. Now, friends, with a little bit of a description of the entire theme, we should focus on the literary influences on Chaucer in connection with the composition of this particular poem. Chaucer was deeply influenced by Boccaccio for the general idea of the Canterbury Tales. Boccaccio's Decameron is built upon a similar idea, since it is a collection of a hundred stories. 
A closer resemblance can be found in Giovanni Sicravi's Navali. Navali refers to a pilgrimage, a leader, and a by play among the pilgrims. So we can easily cite the examples which exercised influences on Chaucer in connection with composition of this particular poem. Chaucer was deeply influenced by Boccaccio for the general idea of the poem. Boccaccio's Decameron is built upon a similar idea since it is a collection of hundred stories narrated by ten people belonging to the gentle class who in order to escape from a plague take a refuge in a palace. However, it is not certain if Chaucer was acquainted with Decameron because if he was familiar with it, he should have referred to it in his own work. Moreover, Chaucer's magnum opus is much more comprehensive in scope in comparison to Boccaccio's grand work called Decameron. A closer resemblance can be found in Giovanni Scarivi's Novelli, which refers to a pilgrimage, a later by play among the pilgrims. Again, there is no evidence that Chaucer was familiar with this work. However, the influences be, and to whatever context they may be, that went into the composition of the great work, the Canterbury Tales. All those influences are tempered by Chaucer's English sensibility. Now, friends, here we have the the anthology of medieval literature. What are they? Courtly romance tradition, elements of Breton lay, retelling of classicalism, sermon having its own didactic purposes, elements of lyric, example of best fable. So all these were prevalent when Chaucer was writing Canterbury Tales. As a collection of separate tales, the Canterbury Tales provides a brilliant anthology of medieval literature. The Knights tell the story of Constance narrated by the man of law represent the courtly romance tradition while Sir Tapos offers the parody of the popular romances as Guy of Warwick or Vavis of Hampton, elements of Breton lay and the supernatural touches fidelity towards lover and setting in Brittany all can be found in Franklin's tale. A retelling of classical legend can be located in the physician's tale of Virginius who kills his own daughter to save, to save her honor. The person's tale can be considered as sermon having its own didactic purposes, while a remarkable example of beat fable can be found in the story of St. and the Dame Pretol told by the nuns priest. Even elements of lyric can be traced in the invocation to Mary in the second nuns tale. Thus, the Chaucer's Canterbury Tales seems to be a storehouse of every possible genre of medieval literature handed down generation after generation and it is handled magnificently and the composition is a masterpiece piece by Geoffrey Chaucer. Friends, up there on the screen you have an arra arrangement. That is group 1A, general prologue, knight's tale, mailer's prologue and tell, ribs prologue, tell, cook's prologue and tell. Group 2, that is B1, man of law's prologue and tell. Group 3, D, wife of birth's prologue and tell, friar's prologue and tell, summoner's prologue and tell. Group 4, E, clerk's prologue and tell, merchant's prologue and tell. Group 5, F, square's prologue and tell, Franklin's prologue and tell. Group 6, C, physician's tell, pardoner's prologue and tell. Group 7, B2, shipman's tell, prior's tell and prologue, prologue and tale of sad tapos, malibus, monk's prologue and tell, non 
prologue and tell. Then group 8 G second nuns prologue and tell, canons yeomans prologue and tell. Group 9 H manciples prologue and tell, group 10 L persons prologue and tell and retraction. Most of the modern editions follow the arrangement of the Elismer manuscript. Therefore, it has contemporary relevance. Now, if we place Chaucer's works into groups, sub certain groupings can be formulated upon the way pilgrims are described by Chaucer in the general prologue. First group, the knight, the square and the yeoman. Second group, the prioress, the monk, the friar. The third group, the merchant, the clerk, the lawyer, the franklin, the five guildsmen, the cook, the shipman, the physician, the wife of Bath. Fourth group, the person, the plowman. Fifth group, the revy, the miller, the summoner, the pardoner, the manciple Chaucer himself. So, in these groups, we can easily understand the wide varieties and ranges of characters Chaucer has dealt with. On the whole, the Canterbury Tales presents a wide panorama of characters. It is a character gallery, character from different spheres of life. So, friends, in this module, we have tried to understood the contribution of Canterbury Tales. We have looked into Canterbury Tales from close quarters. We have had the details of the text, we have contextualized it in the context of the creation of the text, production of the text and the reception of the text. We have a discussions on its social background. We have elaborated on the art of characterization from the part of Chaucer. We have also grouped the characters into categories. On the whole, the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer is by far the most prominent text in his own in his generation. It is not a, not a text for one generation, it is a text for generations in English studies. I hope you enjoyed your module on the Canterbury Tales. Friends, up there on the board a few audio visual links, please note them in your exercise book. Geoffrey Chaucer is buried here in Westminster Abbey. It was his tomb here in the south transept that started the tradition of Poet's Corner. Chaucer was the first great writer to write in English when the court was still writing in Anglo-French or in Latin, and his work was among the first to be printed by Caxton in English. His most famous work is, of course, Canterbury Tales. Part of the greatness of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales is the richness of description with which he pictures his medieval world. Chaucer uses the framework of the pilgrimage to bring together characters from every level of society, peasant, nobleman, clergy, and the new middle class, and portrays them and their lives in vivid detail. <laughs> the destination of Chaucer's pilgrims was Canterbury <laughs> Cathedral. When St. Augustine arrived in Britain in 597, he established his church in Canterbury. Since then, Canterbury has been the head of the church in England and the seat or cathedra of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Gothic cathedrals are built in the form of a cross. We are standing in the nave. Traditionally, the long narrow nave with its massive pillars runs from west to east. 
Imagine being a peasant in the Middle Ages, having spent your life in a hut coming into this magnificent structure. The stone screen separates the area where the common people would have stood during a service from what's called the choir, Q-U-I-R-E, where the clergy and the nobility gathered in privacy for the service. Gothic cathedral's stained glass windows are an example of making the architecture serve the function of the church. The windows teach Bible stories and saints' lives in picture form for an illiterate population. But why did Chaucer choose Canterbury Cathedral as the destination for his pilgrims? Because of the story of Becket. Here you can see steps leading up into the choir that are worn from the feet and even the knees of pilgrims. After Thomas Becket was murdered here in the cathedral, the Roman Catholic Church canonized him as a saint and people began making pilgrimages to his tomb where there were reports of miraculous healings. Chaucer's pilgrims were all on their way there to pray at the tomb of Thomas. Pilgrims came to pray for forgiveness of sins or for healing for themselves or a family member or as we know from reading about some of Chaucer's pilgrims some people came just for the excitement of getting away from home and making a journey. Although the tomb of Becket no longer exists, it was destroyed by Henry VIII. Canterbury Cathedral still marks the place where it stood. <laughs> I'm now standing in the choir, looking up past the cathedra, known as St. Augustine's Chair, into the apse and the site of Becket's Shrine. Next, we're going to move into the cloisters just outside the cathedral. We're standing just outside the north transept looking into the rectangle formed by the nave and the north transept. This area, known as the cloisters, is where the monks would have lived and worked in the Middle Ages. This is also where the story of Becket's murder begins. In the 12th century, during the reign of Henry II, there was a great controversy and power struggle between the state and the church. Henry, as king, of course, felt that he should have total power, total wealth, but the church disagreed. They had their own system of ecclesiastical courts, and priests could not even be tried in civil courts. Henry decided that a good solution to this problem would be to appoint his friend Thomas Becket as Archbishop of Canterbury. He did, and the problem is that it didn't work out quite the way he had planned. Once Thomas became a priest, he became very serious about his church, churchly duties. Once he became archbishop, he became totally devoted to those duties. Henry II 
was enraged that his plan had been worked. According to legend, one night in December 1170, he said in a fit of anger, Will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? And four of his knights decided to do just that. When the knights arrived in Canterbury, the monks tried to get Thomas into the cathedral. Since a cathedral is a place of sanctuary, it was not only illegal but against the law of the church to violate that sanctuary, and the monks thought Becket would be safe inside this doorway into the cathedral. But the knights went inside anyway and murdered Thomas Becket there, slicing off the top of his head with their swords. People were outraged by what had happened. Not only were the knights guilty of a grievous sin in murdering an unarmed priest, they were even more guilty because they did it in the cathedral. People were horrified by the act and angry at the king for encouraging it. King Henry II actually did public penance to atone for his part in this murder. Although Becket's shrine no longer exists, this sculpture commemorates the place where the murder took place. An interesting footnote to the story of Becket's murder takes place in the crypt during World War II. The Germans attempted to bomb Canterbury Cathedral, knowing it would be very discouraging for the British. Although the cathedral survived, the next morning officials found this stain on a pillar. It's reputed to be the ghost of Becket, who returned during the night of bombing to protect the cathedral.